You know the song by Willie Nelson, My Heroes Have Always Been Cowboys? If cowboys are heroes, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Of course, when we were little kids, uh, you know, we, that's what we wanted to be. And nobody wanted to be the Indian, by the way. <laughs> when you look back on American history, the Tonto, <laughs> you look back on American history the past couple of hundred years, um, we had some great heroes. Uh, Abraham Lincoln saved the Union. Um, Teddy Roosevelt rode up San Juan Hill with a bunch of misfits, mm -hmm. the Rough Riders. Then you go down to uh, Sergeant York in World War I. We had Patton in World War II. And uh, how, who can forget the John MacArthur? Not uh, John MacArthur. Douglas. General MacArthur. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas. Douglas MacArthur, yes. I shall return, a man of his word. He went, <clears throat> and he went back. John MacArthur. Uh, <laughs> you know him too. <laughs> and they come down to the past, in the past uh, couple of decades, we had these guys from 9-11, um, the firemen who went in there, we don't know their names. There over 200 firemen lost their lives in the, when the Twin Towers went down. And then Todd Beamer um, took down Flight 93 in Shanksville, Pennsylvania to save Washington, D.C. Um, let's roll. So mm -hmm. We've all been heroes like that. What about the heroes from the Bible? The man we should learn from, apart from the man we, we know from, uh, you know, from recent history. And it's, it's, uh, it's kind of timely you're talking about David there, because you think about David's mighty men. Mm -hmm. um, I had a message I was going to speak about, I started around you this week, and then the Lord changed it up on me. And he said, this is where you're going. David's mighty men. And what we're going to look at this morning is not just David's mighty men, but the mighty men of the son of David. And how we are supposed to learn from both and be the mighty man that Christ calls us to be. So if you have a Bible, um, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23. And um, I might skip over some of the names because they're kind of hard to pronounce. <laughs> well, chapter 23 verse 8. And these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph, Bashebeth, Atakemonite. I see that okay? Hmm. Chief of the captains, and he called Adino the Esnite because of the 800 men slain by him at one time. So Joseph was the number one man. He was a chieftain. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahoy, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle and the men of Israel had withdrawn. He, Eleazar, arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to strip the slain. I'll pause there for a while because I want to address the three mighty men right here. David had uh, 400 men follow him. And these three men stood out. There was, now there was another layer of, of men, and, and we won't have time to study those guys. The second layer was led by a man named Benaiah. And Benaiah has quite a history that we won't go into in, in detail, but his, uh, his ancestor, his, his, he was descended from Phinehas. Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, the high priest. And this guy was a hero. I mean, it, it, was, it was said of Benaiah that he slayed a lion in the middle of a pit in the snow. <clears throat> so that, that tells us if he's in the middle of the pit, he wasn't backing up. He was going after the lion. Hmm. That's the kind of man that we have here in Benaiah. But the three uh, heroes who rode with David, let's call him Joseph to keep it short, Eleazar, and the other guy. Um, you know the other guy. <laughs> the, the three guys. Kind of relate that to the three, the, the three men that Jesus took with him up to the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. Why, why were they selected? Well, Peter, the rock, James and John, the sons of thunder. Those guys could preach down fire from heaven, and they wanted to. So, what, but what, were, what were the qualifications of these men who followed David? And if you turn back to 1 Samuel with me, 1 Samuel chapter 22, I think. In verse 2, we will see why they followed David. Not just these three men, 
but all 400, because they wanted to run from Saul who was trying to kill him. Look at verse 22. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented, <coughs> gathered to him, David, and became cap and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. King David had about 400 men with him. He's on the run from Saul for what, 14 years, something like that, quite a while. He was already anointed king, but he, was, uh, he hadn't assumed the throne yet. But what I'll be doing in this, uh, in this short message here is, is going back and forth between the Gospels, uh, between Jesus Christ and the kind of man that he wants us to be, and the, the kind of mighty man these guys were. It says here in verse 2, And everyone who was in distress, that sounds like us. That sounds like uh, back uh, of Jerusalem and, and Galilee back in the day. It was hard. It was a hard life. These fishermen out there. It's a hard life now. We're in distress. You look at Christians all over the world persecuted. You look at the body of Christ going in disarray in the United States and the West. People are falling out, apostasy everywhere. People just falling apart. We're in distress. The church is in distress. Everyone who was in debt, we're, we're in debt up to our necks. Not just financially, but we're in debt uh, in, in a certain sense to the commitments we make that we can't keep sometimes. We kind of overextend ourselves uh, here, there, and everywhere. Um, I know, like pastors, you guys have it hard. Because you got uh, people coming at you uh, at different, um, with different things in churches, uh, leaders uh, in, in their homes. Shabbat was telling me about his, uh, his dad having to move from, from uh, one place to another and having difficulty finding a place for assisted living. And, and as we get older, we're going to need more care like that. So we're in distress and we're in debt. And everyone who is discontented, uh, Saul was a hard man. Saul was a, he used to tax them like crazy. He was a really hard man. When, when Israel wanted a king and God said, I'm going to give you a king, well, here's what he's, he's going to do, X, Y, Z, he did it. Mm -hmm. And they, were discontent, they became discontented. Now, it was men like these who gathered unto David. And um, kind of like Gideon's army. And it probably was like the Rough Riders to a bunch of misfits. <laughs> mm -hmm. And David was the leader. But these three men, back to 1 Samuel, chapter 23, verse 8 and on, these three men stood out. The first man, Joseph, he killed 800 men at one time. You, you wonder why uh, people always uh, hold Israeli intelligence in this, in this current time, really high, even higher than the CIA, because of the kind of man that we had back then, they have a line us. They've got something in them in the favor of God over the Holy Land. That, that is just amazing. 800 men at one time. We had Orny Murphy back in uh, World War II. He was the uh, most decorated soldier in World War II because he killed 21 men. Uh, here is Joseph Bas Hebeth. Killed 800 men. Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahoy. And then uh, he, it stood that he stood in verse 10. He arose and struck the Philistines with his hand until his, he couldn't go anymore. Mm. And he held that sword. And he, he, one man. And after that, there was Shema. Now, Shema is, is Hebrew. You know, it's Jehovah Shema, the Lord, it's, the Lord is there. Well, he defended the food. So we had the other two guys um, taking down as many enemies as they can. And here's Shema who was, uh, in verse 11 says, and the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, peas, and, and food is at a premium back in those days, and fed those guys. Because you had a lot of men on the run all the time with no steady income and no grocery store to buy it. So he defended the food, but then he took his stand in the middle of the <coughs> plot, defended it. You notice all these men, Benaiah, who stood in the middle of a pit in the snow and, and killed a lion. And now we have Shema here. He stood <clears throat> in the midst of the plot, the big piece of land by himself, and defended all the food, defended and struck the Philistines one and one, and the Lord brought the victory. So let's go over to, before we get to the next part of the passage from 13 down to 17, and see what kind of man God is calling us to be, the son of David, Jesus Christ. First of all, 
Let's shoot down to John chapter 6. I want I to read, um, I'll just tell you what happened there. Remember, Jesus was telling them about the, uh, it's a really long passage, where Jesus was hitting the river, the robber was starting to hit the road, and he said, this is who I am, are you going to follow me? And John 666, which is a, an appropriate number. Some of them turned away and walked away. And Jesus said to Peter and the, uh, the other guys, are you going to leave there too? And Peter said, Lord, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. So they stood with him. So the first thing we see, being a mighty man of the son of David, Jesus Christ, following on the footsteps of these men who stood alone, who stood on conviction, is that we are called to be men of conviction. Men of conviction. Like Martin Luther, when, when he was called up in, in front of the Diet of Worms and, 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 and the Catholic uh, authorities asked him to re recant everything he said when he nailed those 95 theses to the wall, to the door of the church. And he said, no, here's where I stand. Uh, Psalm 16 says, I shall not be moved. Everything about, you look, you go through all, all through history and all through, not just Bible history, but modern history. The great men of the faith stood on the word of God and they did not move. So the first thing we're called to be is a man of conviction. These men, these mighty men of God, of David, stood their conviction. They stood in the middle of the battle. We are like remnant in here. We're a remnant, uh, not just here, but just uh, everywhere there are men like us. We're very few. But are we going to stand? The next thing we're going to be, he's, he's calling us to be, to, commit, to be committed to him. It's one thing to believe it, to go show up on Sunday morning and, uh, and listen to the word and get convicted. The next thing is to be committed. Like, um, you hear people say, Jesus is my savior. Great, he's your savior. Um, <clears throat> how do you know that? Well, I prayed a prayer, I raised my hand, I walked down the aisle 16 times, mm -hmm. um, I went to a conference, I went to a concert, and uh, Chris Tomlin asked me to walk down the aisle, and I did that. But is he your Lord? When Jesus Christ is your Lord, you are committed to him. And that's where a lot of people um, in the West have this stumbling block that's, that's holding them back from being committed to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now there's a, you know, have you heard the word Lordship Salvation? There, there is this, this term that they call use Lordship Salvation, which is um, a derogatory term, meant, to, meant that you, it sounds like you have to do something when, when grace is free. Grace is free, but Jesus Christ has to be your Lord. Because remember he said in Matthew 7, 21 I think and on, why do you call me? Um, yeah. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. But why are they saying it then when it's too late? You have to be committed now. And to be a committed uh, man of, of the son of David, you have to be submitted to him. And we in the West have a problem submitting. Not just to authority, but to a pastor of the church, to a leader of a group, to our bosses, uh, anything. Um, even this thing such as uh, in, in the marriage with a wife being submitted to a husband is misunderstood and, and, and mischaracterized everywhere. So God is calling us to be a man of conviction, a committed man with Jesus Christ as Lord. He's also calling us to be a man of courage. Now you notice all these things start with C. Conviction, committed, courage. Mm. Now being a man of courage takes a lot of self-control. That's the first thing we have to learn. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit, self-control. And we know what self-control is. We have to control ourselves. Mm. Then he's called us to be a man of passion. A courageous man is a man of passion. Passion about the things of God. And the more you dig into this word from cover to cover, you can't help but be a man of passion. Loving God is like, wow. I remember the first time I read through the Old Testament. I wish there was more because um, well, uh, earlier more, Lord, you know what he wanted? Me to go back through and read it again. Because I missed so, so many things over the past 25 years that every time I go through it, the second, third, 55th time, I find something new in it. And 
become a man of passion by going through the word like that and also by praising him when you see um, what he did, not just here, but what he's doing in your lives because you can't help but going through the word and it not affecting you, and not, not, not firing you up, not making you a, a, a more focused, not making you more, well, clearing your conscience and also making you a man of prayer. A man of passion is a man of prayer and, and praise. Um, I remember a story of uh, this wife went to the pastor's office. She said, um, <laughs> would you pray for my husband? Why? Because, well, he keeps asking me to pray for X, Y, Z, but he wouldn't do it. Uh, you guys probably hear that uh, in various forms all the time. Men will, will ask their wives to go to church. They will ask, him to, ask their wife to call the pastor, but they won't go to the Lord themselves. You know, just like Adam, you guys were talking about Adam earlier on, mm -hmm. messed up. God's going to hold us accountable if we don't do what he's calling us to do. And that's one of them is to be a man of prayer. And, and, and when Jesus was given the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, when you pray, when you pray, and then when you pray, and then when you fast. He didn't say if, he said when. So a man of passion is a man of praise, prayer, and the word. And also calling us to be a man of action. We, we got a lot of guys that, in church these days, even though we're kind of a minority, because still, even now, in evangelical conservative churches, most of the... Uh, People in the congregation are still women. In a, an average evangelical church, the average amount of men there is like 40%. But still, a man of courage is going to be a man of self-control, passion, but he also has to be a man of action. A man of action, take the reins. Don't, miss, don't stand up there and uh, let your wife talk to the snake, and then go take the apple or the fig, or whatever it is, and eat it. Being a man of action, say, no, that's not it. Hmm. So we're going to be a man of conviction if we're going to follow the son of David like these men followed David. A man committed to him as Lord and a man of courage. Also, the next thing is we have to be a man of character. A man of character. Look at, Psalm, look at Samuel 23 again and look down at the end of that chapter on verse 39. The Bible gave us the list of all of David's mighty men, and look who the last man was. Uriah the Hittite, 37 in all. The mighty man of God, the last man was Uriah the Hittite. When David was on his balcony, and the kings went up to war, and he wasn't there, and he saw this young lady taking a bath, the Bible didn't say that he knew her, but we see now that he knew who she was. Her husband was one of his mighty men. He probably had his eye on her all that time. And there's a reason why, and first, the last name there is Uriah the Hittite. When Uriah, when, when David had the affair with uh, Bathsheba, and, um, and he called for Uriah to cover up his sin, and Uriah refused to go along with David's plan. He proved to be there a man of integrity. So um, a mighty man of the son of David, just like Uriah the Hittite, is called to be a man of character, a man of integrity, a man who's going to say no. Um, I can't do that there when my men are out there fighting. I can't do that. A man of character is also a man of honesty. He's also trustworthy. He also guards his heart, his mouth, his thoughts, his conduct. Most of all, with all of that, we have to be guarding the name of the Lord. He's going to hold us accountable if we allow his name to be dragged through the mud when we act like Adam, when we act like David when he sinned, and a whole bunch of other stuff everywhere. So a mighty man of the son of David is a man of conviction, committed, courage, character, and part of that is me. Uh, he means we build up others by example. Sometimes we don't have to say anything. Um, Saint Francis of Assisi said, "Preach the gospel at all times, son, and if possible, use words." Mm. We want people to follow us because of our character. A mighty man of the son of David is a man of confidence, not cockiness. Confidence. The word confidence uh, comes from Latin, confide. Con is with, fide, faith. 
with faith. We're, we're confident because of our faith, not because of anything we do. If, any, if, it's, if that's the case, then we're, we're cocky. A man of faith, and also being a man of faith, we have to know where we're going. It, it takes a while to grow into maturity in, in the faith, to be a, a man of God, a spiritual giant, to be even growing, and there's many, not many of us around. A spiritual giant is a man like my brother over there. Um, <laughs> I, 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 like, I like to talk to you after every meeting sometimes to find out what's the word today. Mm -hmm. Right, you at? Yes. <laughs> you write with him all the time. <laughs> uh, a man like Spurgeon. Spurgeon, um, Spurgeon was funny. Uh, he said the pillow is the, the best counselor because uh, he, he'd have so much going through his mind during the day. And uh, he, he had the most sermons published in the world because every, every Sunday is, and he preached, and then Monday morning, his sermons were in London newspapers all over the city. Hmm. So he be uh, he's got Bible verses and all kinds of troubles, and uh, he's got the largest church in, in London back in the day, about a hundred and something years ago. <coughs> and, he, and he'd be sleeping and talking in his sleep. So he said that the pillow was the best counselor because when he uh, when he went to bed at night, trouble, he would pray and he's like, Lord, what do I do about X Y Z? So uh, his wife said that she would be uh, sleeping next to him, and all of a sudden he starts talking in his sleep, she'd jump up, take a notebook, and start writing down what he's saying. And you know what he ended up in the sermons the next day. So, but the thing is, he knew where he was going. He knew where the source was. He went to the source. And, the, and you know, the Bible says that the Lord gives to us in our sleep. I'm sure you, everyone here has read or something like that. Mm -hmm. a, a confident man not only knows where he's going, a confident man is one who's caring. Caring, not just for... Uh, not just for um, brothers in Christ, not just for the church, but for our own family. Some of, our, some of us guys, um, I, when I was studying for this, I read about a man who uh, he was a great provider. Uh, he gave his kids everything that, he want, that they wanted. And, um, but he didn't have too much love in him. He was, he was like, you know, you do it this way. Um, the kids had everything. And uh, this... Charles Stanley actually told the story. He said that the daughter of this man came to his office and said, I don't understand my dad. I, mean, I don't think he loves me. And, and so he, Charles Stanley let her talk and said, well, why do you say that? Well, he gives me everything I want, but he doesn't listen to me. He doesn't listen. So when, when, uh, when, when when the preacher went to uh, talk to the dad, yeah, well, at first the dad was defensive. What do you mean? I don't listen. What do you mean how she says I don't love her? Um, well, you don't listen to her. You're always trying to talk. You're always trying to tell her what to do. And you're going to end up losing her in the end when she walks away from home and goes to college. And, and we, we men are like that sometimes. We want to have it our way or, or the highway. And sometimes we tell our wives that. And sometimes our uh, wives might give us permission to say that, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we have to care. We have to be good listeners. You know, Jesus did a lot of talking uh, because it's recorded here. But um, how many red letters you see in the Bible? Very few. A lot of the time God was listening and God was judging and God was counseling. But he listened all the time. A confident man is not just a man who's caring, but a man who's compassionate. Compassionate, what we know that means. We really have no problems to be uh, being compassionate because we are men of compassion. I know Willie goes to nursing homes and, and love on the folks up there. Yeah. Um, down in Springfield, we, we, we kind of adopted a homeless mission. We've been ministering at for over a decade. I've seen a lot of miracles there. I've seen drug dealers uh, become well, clean up first, and then clean up their mouth, and then turn around and get saved, and start counseling other people, former drug dealers, and, and, and people who are walking in sin. I remember, um, it's called the Inner City Mission. We, uh, we would provide a meal once a month there, and then we do a Bible study. Um, several years ago, 
I was one of the I was at one of the Bible studies we were doing, and um, there was a knock on the door during the Bible study. So there was probably about twenty-seven people, residents there. It holds about thirty-six residents. And after dinner, we'd ask them to stay back for the Bible study, and most of them would stay. So we heard a knock on the door. I went to answer the door. There's no one there. So I looked down, and I saw this big, huge tub of, of laundry detergent. I brought it inside, and like, uh, so I spoke to the, the person running out who's in charge at night. You know, here, here's someone who just dropped this out there. And she started crying. You know why? Because they had no, uh, no way to wash clothes for that week. Someone just dropped it off there and ran. And uh, I've seen miracles like that, the compassion of, of people. There are some good people out there. We just don't hear about them, and they're, very, and they're mostly <coughs> anonymous, like Jesus tells us to. And um, there are miracles like that everywhere. And if, if we can do those kinds of things and go and announce it, God sees in our treasures in heaven and we'll be building up. Compassion to a man of faith and confidence is not just a man who knows where he's going, but who cares, who listens, who's compassionate, and who's considerate and loving. Finally, let's go back to 2 Samuel 23 and read what happened here from verse 13. 2 Samuel 23, verse 13 to 17. Then three of the thirty chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time to the cave of Adullam, where the troop of the Philistines were camping in the valley of Rephaim. The Rephaim were the giants. And David was then in the stronghold, while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the man who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he should not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. The three mighty men did. In, in the terms of King David, where these men who were in distress, who were discontented, who were in debt, where these men, 400 men followed him, and these three men rose to the top as the cream of the crop. What did they see in David that he would do something like this? What, what really attracted them to David? Because I'm a, if you look at some of the characteristics of these mighty men, they were, and the mighty men of God, uh, so the son of David, and the kind of man we, we should be, they had <coughs> conviction, they followed him, they were committed to the cause, they had courage, of course, you can see that here. And they had passion, they were men of action, Look at all their deeds, the mighty men. They, they call them mighty men because of their deeds. They had character, full of integrity, like Uriah the Hittite. They had confidence in what they did. <coughs> they, were, they were caring, compassionate, and considerate and loving. So what, what really attracted them to, to do something like this? What did they see in this king, who was a king without a throne right at this time? They, they saw something, they saw a man of God. They knew that he prayed a lot. They knew that he, the anointing of God was upon his life. And then it was the same kind of attraction that, that Peter, James, and John followed when they saw Jesus Christ and he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Both men, David and the son of David, Jesus, were outsiders at the time. They were outside the camp. In fact, Hebrews, I think Hebrews 13.3, Hebrews 13, 13 says, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Both men were outside the camp. David was outside the throne where he was supposed to be sitting instead of Saul. Jesus Christ was outside the gate, outside the city. He was an outcast. Uh, we know that from, Psalm, from Isaiah 53 and the whole, all four gospels. 
Jesus was shunned. And Jesus is still outside the camp right now in this world as the majority of the world rejects him. Mm -hmm. Rejects the kind of people that he's calling us to be. So here are these men, these three mighty men of God, the cream of the crop, the top generals in David's army. All David had to say, man, I wish I had some water from outside the well of Bethlehem. I really like how that tasted, it. kind of like a bottle of Dasani or something. Mm -hmm. And they, they broke through the giants, the Rephaim, the giants were guarding this, 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 had taken over Bethlehem, and they were guarding the city. They broke in there, came back with a big uh, a skin of water, and I saw this in a movie one time, and it really affected me. When David got that skin of water, and he poured it down on the altar, he, in the movie he built an altar. You know, kind of, the kind of uh, poetic license for the scripture. Mm -hmm. And he poured it out into the Lord. He said, I can't do this. I can't drink this. I was just making a statement. And there are these men who uh, followed me so much, and who loved me so much, that they will risk their lives to go get this, this tasty special water. Lord, this belongs to you, not me. Do we have that same kind of sacrifice? Do we have that same kind of, 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 of love for God that we are willing to just throw everything down and follow him to be the kind of man of God that he wants us to be here? What we do, as we wrap up uh, this uh, message, and um, I'd like to show us a video. You remember the Titanic went down? Well, there were some stories there that were real untold until recently when, when people did some research. And, and in fact, um, in not, not long after it happened, some of the survivors spoke. But because of the, uh, the nature of, of the disaster, people didn't concentrate too much about it, except in the body of Christ, in the remnant. Remember, the Titanic was the ship that this, that the owner said, he not even God can sink. You don't challenge God like that. Mm -hmm. Now let's watch this video and see what else. Uh, 